Simon DeRosa and I are going live again to talk about executive functioning. We are looking at task initiation and goal-directed persistence. Now these are things that are very important for all of us to develop uh, to you know get things done in our day-to-day -day life. I really like today's topic. I, mean, I like all of them but this is a really tricky one. This is the one I think every parent comes to me, especially older ones, uh, when I'm talking about high school kids, and uh, they just want to talk about how do I motivate my kids? My kids are always procrastinating. Yeah. Mm. So I'm really I know some adults who struggle in this area too. Sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know why, pretty... and I know this. I, I think I know. I'm onto a secret, but uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to, to to get into it. If you're ready to get into it, I definitely am, and I've made you the host so you can pop up the infographic so we can take a look and see what it is exactly you're talking about. If you want access to this infographic, you can join uh, Simon's group, Exceptional Learners on, the, on Facebook. I also have access it, to it. So if you like the Garforth Education Facebook page, send me a message or join one of my groups, Garforth Education Educators Group, Garforth Education Parents Group, or Garforth Education Exceptional Parents Group. And we can make sure you get the resource through there. All right, so when it comes to tax initiation and goal-directed persistence, what we're really talking about is motivation and procrastination. So we don't see these issues when a student or a child is really motivated about the subject matter. So if it's that right. subject or topic that's in their zone, you're not really gonna have to worry about it. So if they love the guitar, you know, trying to get them to practice playing the guitar is not going to be a struggle. But if it's something that's really difficult for them, like reading or math, then they're going to find everything, including cleaning the entire house before they have to work on it. Right? You're absolutely right. Oh, it's been how long since I scrubbed, you know, the, the bathroom sink with my toothbrush? Hmm, I think I better get that done. Right? Uh, and you um, find some adults will clean the house too before uh, before exactly. one can do anything like that. Exactly. Uh, so as, very, very... as parents and teachers, we need to become flexible and adaptive when we're dealing with these issues of procrastination, and we need to think about that war, not the the battle at hand, right? So pick your battles. Make sure you're choosing the appropriate one because sometimes. They just need that. And, you know, some of those times, those procrastination techniques may be something that they need to just refocus and need that time to recenter before they can actually be actively involved in the activity. Absolutely. Sorry about that, Dr. K. I think, I, I think I'm just about there now for you. Look, yeah, picking your battles. This is a, a, a I suppose, first of all, this is one of the tricky, um, uh, EFs because there are some other uh, foundation ones and they've just started some major works outside so <laughs> they've got a burst board of <laughs> if it gets really bad we'll have to be flexible and adaptable again right. um, this is probably one of the if there were higher order executive functions I think this is probably one of them because it really uh, this is really more of an issue for primary kids um, and for older high school kids, and it's dependent upon the development of um, other executive functioning, such as uh, impulse control and uh, emotional regulation and short-term memory as well. Yeah. So we really need, I feel, to strengthen those three areas before you can actually get to this. And that's why there's always such of an overlap with some of these things too. Well, now, yeah. and then I'm pointing out that our... our our students that are exceptional learners are often lagging in these skills from their peers. So developmentally, they're not there yet. Right? Oh, look, absolutely. And, and Russell Barkley talks a lot about that. And I think most of the people know who I, I'm, 
I, I think ADHD and autism is a normal part of the cognitive scale of uh, human existence. But uh, in, in our society, uh, we have to talk about, because of the way our society is structured, uh, we have to talk about deficits and being disabled and, and disorders. And Russell Barclay, with all his work with the MRIs, has discovered, of course, that the, uh, the typical ADHD brain is about 30% smaller than a typical um, developed brain. Now that, that equates to about three or four years younger than their peers. And uh, this is what I often say to kids, don't compare yourself to your friends. Uh, okay, it's just not a fair comparison. And often these kids will, and it can build up that anxiety, which can be a, another, another ball to be juggling uh, in, in all of this. So, uh, yeah, look, uh, <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to, to pull apart, especially with the old ones. But when you had that kind of inner voice comparing themselves, it's often very negative. And I'll be talking about that too, because, you know, some of these kids have heard 20,000 more negatives by the age of nine than their peers. And that has a huge effect on their motivation to do anything. So it is something, and I say further on there, make sure you start with a positive too. Yeah. Well, and anyway, that, well, the inner yeah. voice that they develop, right? If someone's telling you you're stupid, you can't do it, that's going to become your inner voice, right? Yeah. yeah. And so you're going to believe that, and it's going to be very hard to change from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset, saying, you know what? No, I have control over this. It yeah. may be harder for me than it is for others, but it's still something that I can achieve if I put the effort into it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just, just let us know too. There is a bit of a truck outside. I can, I can talk past that. I've taught kindergarten. I can uh, <laughs> focus on what I need to. But if it is getting distracting, give us some feedback, and I'll, I'll quickly make an adjustment. Yeah. Uh, look, you're absolutely right. So know what you know what you're doing. Know that you're dealing with someone that's perhaps three or four years younger, um, and this could be a very complicated uh, area. So look. Sometimes what I like to talk about too is what would it actually look like in the classroom? And I wrote down a few ideas. To me, it's that dithering, not getting started on a task or perhaps going for another pencil or finding another book or that allowing that distractibility to occur. Uh, often uh, copying uh, because kids like to see what's next. So they just need a lead in and sometimes I'll be, they'll be copying their peers, not so much because they can't think for themselves, but because they're just not too sure where to start. In fact, further on, I, I, say, I said here too, if you start hearing words like, show me, I can't see what to do, what's next, just get me started. Because our kids are particularly visual, they might be giving us clues with the words they're actually using. So it's probably not, dithering or copying it, listen out for those words they can be they can be cues um apathy uh, task avoidance uh being distractible uh, uh sometimes you know annoyance and irrit irritability um they can withdraw uh, as well uh, you you mentioned a fixed mindset um and i often talk about a fixed mindset as well if you've got a rigid kind of mindset this is one of the places it can really come out uh, and then especially with a bit of reframing you can uh, tackle it sorry what you're going to say Kathy? well especially for the students that have those routines and that are more fixed in how things need to be done mm -hmm. right so if they have to have their desk perfectly set up with things in the right order or if you know their pencil just isn't quite sharp enough or it's not that can be like a limiting behavior for them that it's hard to get that initiation to start because everything's not just so of what yeah. they've decided they need to be able to work. And yeah. another issue that some of these students might be having is a processing speed issue. And they just need that extra spark to help them see to get the ball rolling. Right. And that's where they're yeah. doing the, you know, looking at their peers, trying to get, just that start so they can just have that tiny tiny little nudge over the 
the edge to get that momentum moving and then yeah. get those ideas flowing. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we can jump ahead later. We'll talk about these uh, suggestions. We do, as they, they just need right? to be able to see their, the first step. But I think, I think the important thing here is that if kids don't get that first step, uh, especially because I've heard so many negatives before, the older kids, older boys will disengage from the learning completely. Um, and then sometimes if really pushed into a corner or, or that, they will fail on their terms. So they'll use an inappropriate strategy to flee that situation, like giving teachers cheek, getting themselves sent out of the room so they can avoid the task completely. And of course, you know, that's when we get that perfect storm of executive functioning just coming together. Anyway, yeah, let's, they'd <laughs> let's get through our see, They'd rather see being as bad than stupid, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, because I've heard 20,000 negatives already, well, they might as well just live up to that self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, teachers, be flexible. Um, and adaptive. Winning the war uh, is probably the most important thing. And honestly, that's what a lot of parents with uh, uh, really significant ADHD kids really want them to do. They just want to get through this school experience. It, it, it is the effort. Um, so have a conversation with the parents too, but pick your battles, I think is really important. Now, uh, use headphones to eliminate distractions. Um, I know some people who don't leave the, the house without those. Uh, or provide the stimulus. You know, for some people, they are sensory seeking, and, and it happens to be oral. And for some, they're trying to, def to limit that. It's a bit like, um, I used to explain it like the old graphic equaliser on, on a, um, and a sound system or a, oh gosh, I'm showing my age now. Um, and you just want to get the bases right and it, you know yeah so each presentation is different so each uh, solution is going to be different for some cutting out that noise is going to be just what they need um, others having that noise um, will actually help them and I'm not just talking about music sometimes white noise street noise <laughs> can actually be handy too any comments on that Dr K Definitely. I mean, I think we even spoke about this last week and how having just that, that something to provide the, just the part of the brain that needs that distraction, right? If it's that classical music or whatever music works for them, as long as they're not too involved in the song that they're able to, yeah, exactly. If they're able to, again, helping them understand that if they want the support in that area they can't abuse it right so if they're going to be singing along rocking out to the music dancing then they can't have that support in place and it may be that some days are are worse than others right so it's not like an all or nothing so you can have this and if you mess up once you can't use it again it's no well if you're if that's not working for you today then we're not using that support today but we can try it again at, a, at another time it's a tool not a toy and as exactly. soon as it becomes the focus, then it's not working. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> use a bullet journal. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very visual bullet journal. I'm using all my texts now. Yeah. Uh, uh, and look, this is handy for, for, for motivation, I find, for two reasons. It's, of course, Getting kids to write it and then read it is one challenge. We've, we've spoken about that too. But a, the part about a bullet journal is that you can break the task up into smaller pieces, keep track of what you're doing. But uh, I know kids who will just go open book on their bullet list just so they can cross it off or highlight it because there's such satisfaction in being able to you know to rule those things off and actually I think that's a good thing because you're getting just a slight kick of uh, endorphins and uh, dopamine saying yep uh, let's get on with it let's do it again uh, and you can ride that wave but also it's reminding them that they have achieved and they have finished something it's not all in front of them they've got some and they've achieved some already now I can see you're dying to share something 
sorry. Well, it, it's very much along with the, you know, educational theory that Anita Archer proposed were saying that success breeds success, right? So once that they get that little taste of success and knowing, yes, I'm on the right path, I'm following the right steps to get to that next step to complete that and having that visual and you know for you, for the students that struggle with written output this is another huge mountain that they need to climb so if you have a um like a pre-done list of steps that they need to do and they just need to check it off and if you, you know you laminate it or have it as it um a document that they can use on their tablet to say yes that's done that's done and they don't have to physically write it out right because that can be a procrastination technique and its own right yeah yep. <laughs> making a list to make a list right i but may have it, a few of those <laughs> yes <laughs> um but if, if you have it so that these are the set lists and it's something that you and the student can develop or one of their supports that they have at the school can develop this set of procedures that you're doing for these assignments so that they can check them off. And you know what? Use it as part of one of your accommodations during test taking, right? Have those steps listed out step by step so they can have it with them. And you know, if the other students are saying that's not fair, give them a photocopy. Like you want this list? Here you go. You have it. Great. You know, even that's though you really don't need idea. that. But yeah. if you feel like it's like a cheat sheet, go ahead, take it. Yeah. 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 I, I've noticed kids are, are being allowed a lot more cheap, what they call cheat sheets, but uh, I, I think they're wonderful. And it also reminds them too, that they have achieved and they will achieve again because these kids are often just stuck in that moment. You know, they're stuck in the present. Mm -hmm. it, it just kind of drags them out to remember you know, because they're not so good at learning from the past, but it reminds them they have achieved and therefore logically if they have achieved, they can continue to achieve as well. That um, next one about breaking tasks up into manageable pieces, we often assume kids can do that themselves. Uh, I, I'm often talking about um, how to actually do that. That's when I do think a calendar's handy. Now, uh, I, I'll find a calendar probably only going to last two weeks, okay, or four weeks. But using the calendar is actually a really handy thing to show them how you've got to put things in place and, and how you can break it up. About, well, you've got to do some reading. How, how long do you think? Okay, well, that's the first part. So it's, well, hang on, we've got to start where it's, where it's due. Um, and then we know we've got this part. Then you've got to write down and plan your ideas, okay? Which day are you going to be doing that? It just helps them structure, put some scaffold around that time. Um, and also give them some feedback that they're pretty lousy at it. <laughs> and they do need help with it. God love them. You've got to let them fail <laughs> safely. But yeah, breaking them up in manageable chunks is something that I think they'll probably need help with all the way through school. Um, it's just not something you can show them once. It's something you're going to have to continue showing them how to do. And giving um, them the opportunity to try and do it. Like if you've done it a couple of times with them, then giving them the opportunity. Do you want to try and do this? Mm -hmm. Scheduling it out yourself, right? You're welcome yes. to ask me for help, but try and put some of the, the, the time, the onus on them so they can start building more responsibility, especially as they get into those later high school years, right? Um, but it, it's fine if they ask for support and then, you know, maybe they fail, right? And they have to do that one assignment where it's done at the last minute, last, you know, night before it's due and they fall apart. Um, and then they realize that, oh, well, yeah, maybe the other way is better. And <laughs> yes, um, it was funny. You I was actually just talking, early. Yeah, I was talking about a, a similar situation or kind of similar. So back in the day when we didn't have clouds and automatic backups, 
Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> I was wondering how far back you're going there for a minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, so I was doing a big final project for university and I had set up my time appropriately, but I didn't save often and my computer crashed and oh, I sure had a backup of a whole French steam board. And this was like the last day before it was due. So I had to stay up until wee hours of the morning to redo this whole assignment and it took like eight hours to do, mm -hmm. right? So they'll see, you know, doing that eight hour crunch in that last minute, they're exhausted, it's not their best work. And you know, how they've done it before mm -hmm. is more relaxing, not as stressful and gets better quality work and likely a more co a positive feedback. And if you're able to have it so that the, the assignment's finished a day before it's due, so that day that it's due, they have the chance to review it and make any last minute changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, um, that is a tricky one. And sometimes you have to let them do that and go through that and then use that as a learning situation. But mm. I, I found, from that, you've got to be very clear about what they want to have in the future. And if they don't want that stress, then somehow if we can encapsulate that in a picture or a small mantra, then that's what I like to have at the top of the bullet journal or stuck on their computer. It's the motivation why, it's the big question. You know, it's answering why. And I talk about that later too. You know, what is the purpose of working hard? And I'm always talking to my students about, well, what does it mean for you? For some people, it means getting into a photography course. For some people, uh, it means that they've got choice. But for some people, it, it you know, it, it means that they, they can get into, um, you know, drawing or visual arts or gaming or whatever it's going to be. But if you can keep that long-term goal front and foremost for them because I'll need help with that then you you're giving them some of that motivation too you're giving them the why and they do need help to to see that as well so well, and yeah. I would even go so far as to say that after you've done it successfully do a little video where they're giving themselves a pep talk right wow, that's a ripper I know a video for their future selves exactly Wow, like, I love that. yourself. Remember when Dr. K or Simon made us do this? <laughs> yeah, it actually wasn't so bad. And we turned out with, you know, a good assignment. And I know you're not going to want to do it. <laughs> I love it. I love this that time. This time when you did it, it was so much better. And especially if they get a good result on their assignment. And then they can say, look. This yeah. is what, you know, my teacher said, this is how well it turned out. And just think of how it's going to be if we don't do this again. Dr. Kate, I think that's my favorite strategy you've come up with ever. <laughs> Thank I you. I love that. A video to their future selves. Exactly. You know. Well, and it, it gives them the proof and the evidence from their self. So they're like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, actually, this, this was you and you said that, right? Mm. And now that we have, you know, the iPhones or the, you know, our smartphones, taking videos, saving them and using them for future use is so easy, right? And, and imagine then, too, if they share that with you or I, and we know they've got an assignment coming up, <laughs> we can send it to them. Oh, they'll yeah, hate it. Exactly. I'll that's what I was going to say. Make sure that you have a copy of that video. So if they delete it, it's not gone. You can <laughs> now remember way back then, right? Uh, and even doing these pep talk videos, um, you know, when they've had a really good lesson with you, right? Yeah. Or something's gone really well, take it, Ooh. film it, and capture that moment so that you can use it in those low moments, right? Yes. And I could, I could even write one for myself. Exactly. Like, remember how good you felt when this happened? You know, today, th this happened today. I'm so excited over it because all my hard work paid off and this is how I feel. And I know right, like talking to my future self right now, this may not 
we feel like, you know, it's going well, but this is going to help you. Let's do it. And thank oh, you that's for a contributor. Yeah, I love it. All right. <laughs> yeah, keep, I suppose summing all that up is try and keep their dream or their motivation real and relevant and close to them as well. Okay. Uh, provide examples and exemplars. I came across a year eight student, uh, 15, 16 year old, and his teacher had provided um, sentence starters for each paragraph. He loved it. Yeah, well, and even creating a reference book or um, file, living document that they can refer to like with Microsoft OneNote or Pages, that they can see sample work for what they're doing to yes. mimic, right? Mm. And change and create so it's similar to what a good looking doc or response is and try and get those elements in the future when they're doing it themselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm often telling uh, the kids uh, go to a particular website that we call the Nessa website, which mm -hmm. holds all the examples and all the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And you can find examples of, of texts and good questions. And sometimes these kids don't want to write. I'll say, hey, just read it and try and highlight the differences between what yours is, what yours, what you would like to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, often because those rubrics that we have are all, again, in words. And these kids tend to think in pictures. So if we can make it as visual as we possibly can, actually give them around a real example, then they can take that first step and they're not gonna be procrastinating, they'll be engaging in that task. So exemplars, uh, I think, are, are really, really important too. Mm -hmm. Actually, you well, know what? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of my year eights this year have had real trouble doing um, Shakespeare uh, and just getting into it but there's lots of YouTubes where they're actually read along YouTubes where they're doing Shakespeare mm -hmm. and you might think, Oh, that's, that's, you know, they're not doing any of the work, but it's just that in, you know, yeah. if you get that first step then often they'll go, they'll go for it all by themselves. Well, and finding like a study partner or a study group to work through and talk the assignment through, not necessarily copying from one student, but talking through <laughs> the assignment and how, to get the answer and what to write. So you have that brainstorming session and like a little small breakout group, right? Yep. And you know, everybody has something to add that's gonna make everyone's assignment that little bit more better and create that thought process a little bit deeper than it would be mm. if they were just on their own. Like I know, like when you and I are doing these lives, we bounce off ideas from each other. Like, oh yeah, next time we should do this. Right? Two heads are better yeah. than one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's about, your, there's also a great piece around there around accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, you, can, you can structure, you can make these kids more accountable. Uh, I don't mean placing more pressure on them, but probably the next, next point is check in with progress more often. Um, just, just see how they're going, you know. Um, because that, that's what they need to keep them on task. They need that feedback of positives as well. They just need more feedback on, on how they're going. Sometimes that really helps with the calendar and the timing. Often I'll say, look, um, I can be your accountability partner, familiar term, and how about you just flick it to me when you've done it? And if they haven't, I can just check in with them and go, hey, is there something we can do to, what's stopping you from getting this done? And um, sometimes it's just a chat, that motivational chat and to, to get it done, which is all they need. But um, you won't know unless you're checking in with them. Well, and creating a visual way to represent the, the goal achievement, whether it's just cutting out a piece of grass paper and it has 10 boxes and every time they do one of the steps of the 10 steps for their assignment, they get to fill in a box. So they have that visual representation of the progress that they're making, right? And that yep. can be a huge, huge motivator. Yep. And Absolutely. just that the satisfaction they get from coloring in that box. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And also, look, if, if you're checking in on them, you, you've got a chance to give them more positives. 
Mm -hmm. And we all know if you want to change a behavior, you don't stop a behavior, you encourage a new one. Right. I, lo I love all that stuff in the brain about new synapses. Anyway, but that's another one. Now, this next point about send the copy of assignment to the parents. Look, I, I can hear teachers going, oh, come on. These kids have got to do something for themselves. This is about, you know, this is about picking your battles. Okay. Now, if you're doing that with the parents, uh, it, it means that the parents have got a chance to support you as well. So it's, whilst it might seem a lot, especially when, you know, you've got not one in 20, but you've got four or five of these kids in your class. If you could group them together and just make it into a habit or make one of them responsible for, for emailing it or having a secondary source of information, in the long run, it's going to be easy for you. It's a, it's a, it's a quick little investment um, because <laughs> getting it into the bag and out of the bag <laughs> is actually much more difficult than you would think. And I think you only really un understand and appreciate that when you've um, and had one of these kids in your life. <laughs> and <laughs> and out of the bag so you can still read it. So there's nothing spilt on it and it's not crumpled up and ripped. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> you know what? Some of these kids are going to need this support throughout their lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of our more um, severe, if you want to use that term, individuals with exceptionality do need the support throughout their life. Yeah. And you know what? Just because the parent has a document doesn't mean that the kid gets to use it. It just means that the parent has it there in case it's not there when they need to do it. Mm -hmm. And it gives the parent the idea of about how to check in with support and have ideas to suggest ways to subtly get the work done and help mm. their child instead of mm. frantically trying to figure out what's being done based on what's brought home the, you know the pieces of the assignment or what the child can remember mm. and you're saving yourself from frantic emails from parents at 10 11 12 o'clock at night saying ah this assignment's due tomorrow and i have no idea what it is and my child's freaking out do something about it i mean it's going to take more off of your plate i think yeah, and and often to you know, parents will, uh, teachers will say um, they'll have a, a platform on, on which uh, the school shares. Uh, you know, sometimes it's Google Classroom. Uh, they all have a, a variety of different ones, and they say, "Oh, it's on there. All you have to do is go see it." <laughs> it's like going to the bag. It's it's they're forgetting how much effort it is to actually get to that spot and children who uh, are all over the this digital platform and whose parents may not be can often use that as ex as an excuse not not because then they're, they're mean naughty or anything like that but if they know they can't find it and their parents can't access it then they've avoided the whole task they've procrastinated successfully so they're going to use that strategy again but if you sidestep it and gone straight to the parents as a teacher, then you, they, they're not going to be able to that, use that excuse as well. Um, not, not that they all use that excuse, but sometimes these kids are so anxious and so worried about starting that they'll fail on their own terms. They're, they're quite happy well, to exactly. do that. Exactly. They'd rather point. fail not trying than fail because they couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, def definitely worth uh, communicating with the parents. Yeah. Yeah, and um, then you're reframing mm. the black and white thinking, and that's very much cognitive flexibility, right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. So that's one of those foundational skills that we spoke about earlier that needs to be developed in order to support these higher level skills. Oh, absolutely. It's all about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And that's the type of language that you, you might be able to pick up on if you're trying to work out or find out what's going on. It, yeah, black and white thinking is really uh, of a, a fixed mindset. Um, and this is, that's why I love all the work, wonderful work about a growth mindset, because you can model the language and all of a sudden the kids are using that language and they're going, oh yes, yeah, so I have to actually do this too. Mm. Yeah, reframe black and white thinking. Now, that bit down the bottom, that, that's actually my secret weapon. Mm -hmm. 
that, that that is the thing for me if you can find the fun the creative aspect um or if you can find the personal challenge or personal meaning for the kids you'll get the kids engaged uh, but it, it's not easy <laughs> saying that is is not easy but if you can find it they, you can almost get their hyper focus because so these kids are bored you know and unless they're invested in some way that they're, they're just not going to get into it you know they don't see the sense of homework especially when teachers don't correct it they, and there's all that division between home as well but if you can make it fun you, you can engage these kids in it i'm sure i've talked yeah you know it's if you can find that or help them find it then then you can get these kids engaged in things pomodoro technique that's your favorite isn't it yes well i was i was just gonna say something to your last point though the other thing that teachers need to remember is look at the assignment that you're talking about. And one of the, the things that struggles with motivation and test initiation is seeing if that assignment is actually testing their knowledge of what your goal of finding out for that assignment is, or is it testing the child's disability or areas of weakness? So if it's something that's testing their areas of weakness, and their knowledge try and find another way for them to give you the information about what they are trying to show you right if they if you're getting them to write an essay to show you their knowledge about something having to do in social studies say well you know what as long as you show me what you know on this area and it covers this information if you do a powerpoint presentation if you create a video if you do that uh, the slow animation, if you do some way of showing me that you know this information, I'll accept that, right? Thank you, Pebbles. Yeah, and as long as they're showing you that they know the information and the task isn't, can they write an essay? The task is, show me what you know about this topic. Let them show you what they know in a way that's meaningful to them, that's not as challenging to them. Yeah. And you'll get a lot better results. What's, what's the war? What's the battle? What's the big thing? What's mm -hmm. the long game? Engagement. Yeah. I and mean, keeping them there. Mm. Yeah. yeah, look, I, I love the Pomodoro technique. Hey, did you ever, have you ever heard of that course, Learning How to Learn? It's the most popular course in the world, and over one million people have done it. Yeah, I've never done it. Uh, I, I've heard I did of it, it. <laughs> haven't done it. Um, but I, I I've got to the point where I, I think I know how to learn. <laughs> I thought I did too. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, one of the places where they talk about the Pomodoro technique, the, the tomato technique. And it was only a tomato technique because uh, there happened to be a timer, a kitchen timer in the shape of a tomato. Yeah. And you'd set it for 35 minutes and go hard and get absolutely everything done. I've tried this. And sometimes it doesn't work uh, because the ticking can be a complete distraction and they just want to watch this tomato. Yeah. That's where I find the visual timers less of a distraction uh, as well. So that's why I had a little picture of, of the visual distraction. But the Pomodoro technique can be really handy if you're setting up a study area, uh, like a study schedule. So let's do 15 minutes. And then have a quick two minute break, uh, exercise, get those uh, endorphins uh, and dopamine going again, settle down for another 15 minutes uh, and just ride that wave. Uh, 15 minutes, I'd say high school, primary, um, lower high school, I'd be going for you know 30 minutes, really depends. Uh, but up to high school, I'd be really going, you know, let's, let's, let's have a crack at 45 minutes five minute break, 45 minute. They need that um, to get used to that as exam conditions and writing an essay in 45 minutes. So I think that's probably the goal. But the Pomodoro technique can be just wonderful with this and it is an advanced learning technique which works. And just because the time's up doesn't mean they have to stop. <laughs> if they still wanna go and it's not a time sensitive issue, then let them go, right? Yeah. And even if you're in the classroom and you have you know, a subject that's next and the child's really into it, don't break their flow. Is it really essential 
that yes. they learned that social studies lesson when they're so involved and in tuned in this, like that's the worst when you have to stop and restart and you can't get back to that flow that you're in. Oh, look, I, I don't use the word hate very often, but that's yeah. what I hate about teaching at the moment. You know, you've got to teach this at this time and do this much of it. You know, I love teaching the teachable moment. When you've taught a good lesson and the kids are focused and they're engaged, let them go. And, and that's so important with the study thing. And that's one of the things I talk to kids about. Just if you're in the flow, just go. Mm -hmm. Just just go with it. You know, maybe stop after an hour uh, because you actually have to let your brain kind of absorb uh, and, and rest. But yeah, if you're in the flow, just go. But we're talking about things that they don't want to do at mm -hmm. the moment. You know, the things uh, that are it hard. It could start out as something they don't want to do and then they get the flow and they don't want to stop. <laughs> yeah welcome <laughs> welcome to parenting and teaching <laughs> it is like that that's why i like that mantra uh, it's just the next point try mantra think aloud think ahead you know if you can make these routines and they become habits then you you you're just you're reducing the cognitive load so they can actually focus on the content and the important things which you always draw attention to this um starts start ugly i think is from jessica mccabe in one of her discussions with oh who's that fella who does ad attitude is it attitude no everything 80 uh, everything adhd or everything add anyway they have this, this marvelous discussion of, oh it's on jessica uh jessica mccabe has a youtube channel called how to adhd mm -hmm. she's just some marvelous stuff and she's well researched she is does have a deficit hat on which i don't really like but yeah it's pretty good um she says just start you know and i've added to that uh just start small start bad start ugly just start just try for one minute that's all just try it's and i equate it to jumping in the water um you know the first swim of the season just start it's like the first ski of the season too you jump off the lift, you got there, and you can just kind of go, oh, that's looking a bit steep, and I'm wondering if my body's going to remember this. <laughs> and as soon as you start, you're away, and you, you know, your, your body remembers how to do it. Um, it's just that leap of faith. You just need someone to push you off the edge sometimes. Well, and and you again, jump in the water than to slowly wade in when it's cold, right? Look, you can do the wade, and isn't the wade interesting? Yeah, you walk, you walk in and then you go on your tippy toes to try and avoid it. You know? And I, I don't know what this has ever done to help you get into the water. <laughs> and of course, everyone says, oh, it's fine once you get in. But, you know, it's just making that start. Um, I think that'd be a great mantra at the top of that list of things to do too when you have your bullet journal. Mm -hmm. Start small, start badly, just start. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on. Oh, oh yes, just looking at the time. Oh my goodness, we always chat so much. Positives before negatives. Um, yeah, um, I, I suppose that really relates to the point about. Uh, oh gosh, was it ninety thousand? I, I keep on finding it so hard to remember that. Or was it twenty thousand negatives by the time they're nine? Yes, yeah, twenty thousand negatives by the time they're nine. Um, and you need to catch these kids quickly. Um, because after they've heard that many negatives, they, they almost expect you to say something negative. Uh, and that can, that can really feed them uh, too, unfortunately. And when they hear more negatives, we don't want that inner voice to be an inner critic. We want, them, we want that inner voice to be an inner cheerleader for them. You know. Well, and when you start with the positives, you don't automatically turn off their brain. Like if they're going to hear a negative first, they're just like, oh, okay, I'm going to tune out now. See you later. Yeah. But you can your interest when you talk about the positive. It's like, I did something right? Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love it when I'd call their name, you know, George. And, you, and they go, oh, no, here I go again. And you go, that's fantastic. And you try and really shift that, 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 that thing. Actually, just hearing their name sometimes, they can just go, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I like non uh, non um, uh, non verbal reminders and encourages as well. Yeah. 
uh, encourage the use of reminders. <laughs> oh, geez. Some of my own, uh, my, oops, some of my other kids, that was a chair just going down quickly, uh, have different reminders for different things at different times. And I know one guy who has guitar practice, so he has a strumming reminder. <laughs> But they get used to them after a while. And sometimes after, when you've got 16 reminders, you just have to change them up a little bit. Um, and provide visual steps. Oh, I suppose that's for everything, isn't it? That comes through in all that we've talked about. Make it as visual as you possibly can. Um, yeah, and I think we've done that with a bullet journal. Yeah, we've covered it in under an hour. I think that's a record. Yeah. Well, look at that. We, I mean, we could possibly talk for more. I'm just going to put the chair up. There we go. Um, I know, I know that we could. But uh, and look, this is one. I suppose we could almost have one for primary kids and one for um, secondary kids, older kids as well, um, because it, it does present quite differently and does become very difficult when you're dealing with anxiety too. Yeah. So as I tend to say uh, with teachers too, you know, when they're saying, well, how do I know this is be learned behaviour, learned helplessness, and how do I know this is the disability, or how do I know this is ADHD? When do I, when do I kind of say, no, this is it? And when do I say, how can I be flexible? Uh, and I, I think there's, there's only probably four things. One, your not just relationship, but your connection with that child is imperative when they know you and you uh, and you care about them and they can see it and hear it and feel it you're going to get an honest response from these kids you'll have adhds in particular who are loyal and feel very deeply they'll respond to the things that you do a child who uh, is communicating something different um, or is just having a bad day for whatever reason they won't respond as quickly so I, relationship, uh, that connection with that child is just so important. Um, the, the other area that I always talk about is uh, frequency, duration, and intensity. So if you just saw one child do one of these things on one day, they're not ADHD. You, you need to look at time, collect that, that detail um, uh, over time and see if there's a trigger. Does this child particularly get distracted every time you set a task? Or um, look for those things. But you know, teachers know this stuff. Unfortunately, they just don't have that time to sit back and watch. And I often encourage teachers, you know, if they can let their, their, their um, class helper or if they have got a teacher's aid or if they can get some professional development time, just get a warm body into their room, sit back, up the back and just watch. Um, you know, one of the things I love about what I do now is I casual teach. I just teach here and there. Uh, I love it because it keeps me real <laughs> and keeps me, keeps me honest. Um, but when you sit up the back and when I'm invited into teachers' classrooms and they're going, oh, I just need help with this, you know, sitting up the back and then I collect data and photos and I show it to them. And it is such a rich capture. They, they just love that information. And then when I sit back and do the teaching and, and they do the watching, often it's, it's not about what I'm doing at all. It's the children's reaction that they're seeing and, and absorbing. So, yeah. Um, that can be a so yeah how do you tell the difference frequency uh, intensity uh, duration uh, and the timing uh, and if you want information then try and get yourself some professional development where you can just watch your class or watch somebody else take the class to watch for the different interactions because if children are avoiding things for you they'll be avoiding things for all the other teachers as well in all the situations and they'll they'll, they'll have predictable strategies to avoid work because mm -hmm. those strategies have, have worked for them before. What we tend to see also is uh, uh, year five, which is a kind of a transition where there's much higher expectations 
uh, the start of high school and the start of senior school is where you really see kids bridges or strategies for EF fall down. Uh, you know, they've had something which worked, but it's not going to survive the extra expectations. So sometimes they'll, they'll fall back to more basic forms of uh, avoidance. Well, and that's where the transitioning planning between those transitions in their education is so important, right? Help them prepare before they make that transition. Tell them mm -hmm. how it's going to be uh, different. Some schools will let you send them in to shadow the next transitional grade. Like they have, you know, um, here when kids go into high school, well, they're still just before they get a day where they get to shadow a high school student and they can see what it's like. Have them talk to other students and get the support or get the suggestions about what's happening. Talk mm -hmm. to someone that's been through a similar situation with a similar um, challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And get, get the supports and the, the tricks. And that's why it's really important that you understand the individual's needs and what works as supports for their needs right and there is nothing wrong with asking them the student or their parents what has worked in the past and what hasn't right because they have that extended view of the child and of themselves and they can say look you know in this situation it worked really well when we did this and it could be even outside of the school context dealing with a similar behavior or issue yep 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 spot on <laughs> yeah and sorry i was I, yeah i'm sorry i had a number of things i was thinking of and going oh i could talk about that or i, I could share about that but uh, i suppose it's almost now and we should bring it up <gasps> next week it's seven out of seven i know wow it's the last of the yeah. seven but then we'll i think we'll continue our discussions on ways that we can uh help bring awareness to some of the mm. issues among our exceptional learners that we so often mm. speak about um, mm. through the awareness months happening in October. Mm. And then we'll have to figure out what to do for November. Oh. <laughs> uh, there's plenty. <laughs> there's, there's plenty, plenty to do. Yeah. But um, yeah, look, uh, Dr. Kay, thank you so much for having me on your program today. It's always lovely to chat with you and I've scribbled down some ideas and I think version two of these infographs, I think you're going to see some of your ideas up there too. Absolutely. Now I have to make sure. Yeah, and it. just for those who are uh, watching, we have been talking about creating a course together to discuss ways to help you as parents and educators to support these executive functions. So you get more of a, a whole view of what executive functions are and how you can support them at home and in school. Mm. Oh, Sam, I just saw your, your message there too. You can see uh, all our previous videos and lives too. Dr. Yeah. K. <laughs> they are on the Garforth Education Facebook page uh, and also on the Garforth Education YouTube channel. I can post a link, but all you have to do is type in Garforth Education and our previous videos should come up. They have been amazing ones. I've really enjoyed them. I know Simon's enjoyed them and I think they can provide a lot of support to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to think so. Yeah, um, no, no, I uh, <clears throat> to put it on my YouTube channel. That's on my that's on my list. <laughs> we'll At least it's it. somewhere, right? Yeah, it it is. It, it's down there. I'm getting through the list. Don't you worry the about that. Twitter account. <laughs> Stop picking on me. <laughs> Yeah, but they so are up on YouTube, so people can access them. They don't have to be on Facebook to access them. That's right. And they are welcome to share them with anyone. You know, we're doing this for educators and parents as a group around the world. It's a global effort to help everyone that we can, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Because there's, there's similar challenges. And like I, yeah. Um, you know, I love what I do and I am, you know, when people ask me, you know, how are you feeling? I say sensational because I get to do uh, this job, which is to help people. I love it. <laughs> it's great. 